lot of the work that my group does is focus on understanding fuel cells, um, so hydrogen fuel cells, uh, as well as similar type systems. And so what we see is these are very complicated systems in terms of a lot of different phenomena that are happening at different scales. But when we look at it, you know, these are similar to uh, uh, batteries, except for they're open systems, unlike a lithium ion, but they're all kind of electrochemical systems where nominally we have some kind of ion uh, conducting uh, separator that doesn't allow the electrons through. We have cathodes and anodes uh, and, and uh, catalyst layers. Uh, we have some kind of vacuum materials that allows transport of, of gases or, or, or liquids, depending on our system. Uh, and of course, these are all uh, reacting as we go forward. Uh, we can look at uh, similar systems such as flow batteries, um, once again shown here, or electrolyzers, kind of the opposite of fuel cells. Uh, but as I said, they're, they're very complex in that you need a lot of different uh, transport phenomena and a lot of different percolated pathways uh, as we start to operate these. Uh, and so if we look at this, this is what it looks like uh, inside a little bit, is we have this ion conducting membrane that I mentioned. We have these catalyst layers, uh, these backing layers. Uh, but you really, you know, within these catalyst layers is you need very highly active materials uh, and highly active catalysts. Uh, and you need these kind of different percolated pathways that have very good transport properties. And so it is material dependent um, to a large extent. However, when we look at some of the transport, once again, we see that this is a strongly a multi-scale phenomena, such that we need the macro scale transport through the layer. This goes to local scale transport, which even goes to even further local and molecular scale transport at kind of the angstrom or nanometer scale for the reactivity. And this is just one example of ion and gas transport. In fuel cells, we generate water and typically liquid water because we're at below 100 degrees Celsius. And when we do that, then we have to worry about multi-phase flow in some of these backing layers. Uh, and it starts to get really complicated really fast. Uh, and so if we look at what we call the mass transport losses. And here I'll give examples of a, a proton exchange membrane fuel cell. So protons going through a hydroxide exchange membrane fuel cells. So hydroxide ions uh, going through or a, a proton exchange membrane electrolyzer. When we do the breakdown of the performance, and this is what we call voltage loss breakdowns, we see that as we start to operate at very high current densities, which are gonna be relevant for technology, uh, we get these kind of extra losses that, that are you know, not linear in nature, uh, more exponential in nature in terms of the mass transport limitations. Uh, similar, you know, we have our material losses, our intrinsic catalysts, but then we always have kind of these extra uh, losses. This is uh, shown in, in the anion exchange or hydroxide exchange membranes, uh, which have a little bit more ohmic loss and, and water dependence. And even in the electrolyzers, we're getting more of these kind of uh, losses, mass transport, and bend over, which are related. Uh, and so, as I mentioned, what you do is you see that these are kind of this exponential nature, and it goes towards this limiting current or this kind of maximum uh, current that we're going to be able to achieve uh, under operation. And so, understanding how materials perform under these limiting conditions is actually quite important, and it can actually limit the overall uh, performance of any kind of integrated device. Uh, we've also seen that, you know, unexpectedly, we can actually arrive at some of these transfer losses. So this is a uh, example in fuel cells where when we want to decrease the material loading, so the amount of platinum we're putting in the system, we see that uh, surprisingly, we get this uh, huge exponential increase in this transport resistance. And this transport resistance is really very local to the reaction site due to the fact of the way oxygen has to get through this ionomer film, so this ion conducting polymer film, which has higher resistances when you start pushing and pushing more and more flux through the system. And you see this increase in this resistance. And this was very unexpected and was not uh, really believed to happen until people actually measured it. And now it's actually one of the main things that we're trying to uh, overcome when we look at fuel cells for light duty vehicles.
Uh, and so now for the rest of the talk, I'm, I'm going to go through this in a little bit more detail, an example of CO2 reduction. And so this is taking CO2 uh, and reducing it to fuels or value added chemicals. And so this is a way to close the, the carbon balance and the CO2 uh, emissions issues. And so once again, if we look at the transport aspects, this is looking at the Faraday efficiency. So the amount of uh, products that we're getting that are going towards uh, the products that we might want, such as ethylene, ethanol, uh, maybe even CO or formate, but basically not the hydrogen, which is uh, just the water splitting reaction. And if we look at this limiting current density as a function of diffusion length, we see that all of these planar systems are very limited to very small current densities. And this is going to be a problem if we try and scale up the technology uh, because it will require much larger cells, much more expensive and much more use of the materials. However, if we go towards these fuel cell like systems, these membrane uh, electrode assemblies or these gas diffusion electrodes, we see now we can start pushing out the current density. And the main reason for that is we're decreasing the transport loss of the CO2 to the reaction site. And so this diffusion length, because CO2 is very uh, insoluble in water in terms of about 34 millimolars uh, under standard conditions, is if we decrease that diffusion length going from what we might expect on, on kind of a, even a centimeter scale uh, that we get for boundary layers or 100 microns down to kind of the nanometer scale, we can get to these higher current densities. And these are all experimental data that are essentially showing that uh, behavior. However, because of the way CO2 interacts with the electrolyte, uh, it's very uh, complicated to really understand exactly what happens. So if we have a new catalyst and we put it into the system, we don't really know how it's going to work until we start uh, looking at some of the transport aspects of it. You have to look at everything together. And so what you see here is different devices in the literature that have shown this gas diffusion electrodes. You can get up to uh, higher Faraday efficiencies and higher current densities. And, and once again, when we move to these kind of systems, if we do a back of the envelope calculation, we're seeing that you know, what we're trying to do is really decrease not only the CO2 transport, but really the thickness of these uh, layers. Uh, and so when you decrease uh, the electrolyte layers, and typically, once again, you're on kind of millimeter scale, this can result in you know, over a volt of over cell potential just to get ions through this layer at a decent current density of at least 100 milliamps per centimeter squared. And so you go to these kind of zero gap designs where you maybe have a solution, but the solution is on the outside of the electrodes. So you're minimizing the ionic path to just be between the membrane itself. Uh, and so the way we typically look at this is using a multi-scale multi-physics models. And, and so this is just shown for an example of what we're going to be talking about the rest of the, the lecture. Uh, what we have is perhaps, once again, this exchange solution. We have this anion exchange membrane. Uh, and within the membrane, you can have uh, cations and anions. Some of the cations are going to be screened unless they're condensed with the anions. But you can have uh, hydroxide, which is what we're producing and kind of what we want. But then also because of the CO2 reactions, you have carbonate and bicarbonate as well. Uh, and then you have your cathode catalyst layer, which is doing your CO2 uh, reduction um, uh, or kind of your evolution of your products. You have your uh, cathode diffusion medium uh, to get the gas in and out and then a gas channel. And shown here are just kind of the the word equations, uh, I don't want to belabor it with all the mathematics, uh, but these are kind of standard multi-component diffusion, multi-component uh, ion transport, uh, and of course reaction kinetics, which can have multiple pathways depending on uh, what product we're going after. So as I mentioned, one of the things we do have to worry about is kind of these buffer reactions. We know they occur in aqueous electrolytes. We also know that they will occur as well in the membrane. Uh, and then what we're looking at for in terms of the, the cathode reduction products is kind of multiple things, hopefully going towards something like ethylene, um, but hopefully less and minimizing how much hydrogen we actually end up producing. So if we look a little bit of what occurs in the membrane is, you know, although we're generating hydroxide and it's our main species that we want to transport, because of the CO2 reactions, we get these large gradients in bicarbonate and carbonate. 
And so what actually happens in terms of a CO2 utilization is as we feed CO2 here from the cathode side, we end up dissolving it into the membrane, moving it across uh, in terms of mainly in the carbonate form and then generating it uh, as we consume the hydroxide and change the pH on the anode side. So it's actually an efficient way to make a CO2 pump, but of course that limits our utilization. So in order to mitigate that, we need to think of new materials such as bipolar membranes, for example, that might limit the CO2 generation uh, and, and pump it back towards the cathode where we can utilize it. So now if we look and using the model, once again, we can do these applied voltage breakdowns to really understand as we apply a voltage or apply a potential, what it's actually doing. Uh, and so as I mentioned, what we try and do is minimize uh, the ohmic drop and kind of the transport. We minimize the CO2 mass transport resistances. Uh, and so uh, what we see here is this ohmic drop is gonna be nonlinear with total current density. Uh, and a lot of that is due if we look at the water content. And so what's happening is as you start to drive it harder and harder in terms of going up to you know, an amp per centimeter squared, we're decreasing the amount of water. And that's due to the way the water and the electroosmotic flux and the diffusional flux all interplay with each other, as well as the fact that water is a reactant in a lot of our different reactions. And so if we remember here, you can see that water is uh, uh, a dominant reactant in a lot of the reactions and it has a different order. So for example, here we need to get eight uh, in order to make ethylene. Uh, if we look, we also get these kind of more thermodynamic based uh, trend or, or uh, applied voltages breakdown and losses. But these are once again related to kind of transport because if we look, this is related to the fact that you have different pHs at your two different electrodes. And that's just due once again to kind of ohmic losses and how hard we drive the system uh, such that you get the different pHs will cause these ohmic losses to generate. Uh, and what these are kind of what we call Nernstein losses because they can be predicted by a Nernst equation because of the way the thermodynamics uh, interplays there. Uh, so what happens is when I talk, we get to very water limited conditions very fast. And so now instead of being CO2 limited, what we might have in these aqueous systems, in these membrane electrode assemblies, we're actually water limited. And, and so this is just shown here in these calculations to where we can see we're starting to consume all the water as we go up towards these higher current densities. And now we have to start to depend on water to transport due to diffusion through the membrane from the other side uh, to enable uh, higher conversions. And so now we need to think about what happens if we actually want to uh, increase the overall current density and how do we increase the amount of water in the system? And so there are a couple different ways that we can actually think about doing that. Uh, and so one is to add a water exchange solution uh, on the outside. So now we're adding water to the other side and allowing it to diffuse or permeate through the membrane for the reaction. And so what we see is when we do that, we get overall better performance. We can actually then control some of those Nernstein losses by adding a bicarbonate or a hydroxide solution. Uh, and so we see that this is even better because we get rid of those Nernstein losses as well. Uh, and perhaps even get some gains. Of course, we have to worry about where the solution comes from. And if we recycle it, how it's gonna change as it becomes more and more uh, carbonate form and bicarbonate as the CO2 might come over. Uh, and furthermore, you get into solubility problems. And so this is just shown here is if we start to operate above, you know, 700 milliamps or 800 milliamps per centimeter squared, we get to problems where we get to such high ion concentrations especially on the cathode side of potassium, uh, that you start to precipitate out. And so you start to get solids. And so that becomes a problem in terms of covering your catalyst and being able to utilize it. Uh, and so now if we compare kind of that vapor feed versus that liquid feed, uh, and here we're looking at a copper MEA before it was a silver MEA that was just producing uh, overall uh, CO. So this is gonna produce more products. Uh, we do see that you do get to kind of uh, a less ohmic losses with the liquid feed anode, but interestingly, these start to uh, curve over at the higher current densities. Uh, and of course, at the very low current densities where you're not limited by mass transport, it's not a problem. 
Uh, and so, as I mentioned, as we start to increase we, uh, so current densities, what we see is we're increasing a lot the electroosmotic flux, which is much more linear with current density compared to kind of the diffusional flux, which is just going to be dependent on the conditions. So if we have a liquid feed anode, the diffusion concentration gradient is more or less set. If we have vapor feed, then it's going to depend on the relative humidity. Uh, and so now if we look at that, so what happens is at the vapor feed anode at the higher current densities, the electroosmotic flux starts to bring more and more water to the system uh, and such that at the liquid feed anode and the vapor feed anode cross over because the anode catalyst layer is becoming more saturated and more liquid-like in this vapor feed case uh, because of those uh, different fluxes that I, I was mentioning, especially the back diffusion flux and the electroosmotic fluxes. Uh, what happens here at the very low current densities is the cathode starts to dry out. And so what you see is all this water that's coming on the anode is actually due to the dry out of the cathode, um, which is initially flooded, which is why there's a difference here and, and lower performance with this liquid feed uh, that eventually will, at the higher current densities, becomes a better system to actually use. So this really shows you the interplays of mass transport in terms of the losses and, the, and what's going on in the system. Uh, if we move forward now, we can actually look at, at the product distribution shown here. Uh, and so if we look, initially we have this cathode flooding, uh, as I showed here. Uh, and so in this system, you're starting to start to produce more hydrogen because of that, with all that water there around the reaction site. As we start to go up to higher current densities, it starts to dry out, and we're starting to see some of the products we want uh, until we get to the really high current densities where, once again, uh, we get to different types of regimes and different kinetics. And so that's just shown here, which is going to be much more dominated than by the pH and the pH changes, uh, and especially the way uh, the pH is becoming acidified in the vapor feed case uh, due to the ion transport. And so what that does is that causes a shift in the Faraday efficiency, such that in these cases, we're actually getting uh, less products than we want in terms of if we look at ethylene, we have more in the liquid fed case than the vapor fed case. So although we've engineered our catalyst to produce, let's say ethylene over methane or over CO, we have a problem in that we're not uh, optimizing that production because of the way the mass transport of the water and the CO2 is coming into play. This is also shown in terms of the utilization where in the liquid feed anode, because we have the better ohmic transport in the anion exchange membrane, we have more utilization such that the current density is a little bit flatter compared to the vapor feed anode as shown there. Uh, and so there's multiple ways to do this. So another way is instead of looking at uh, just the vapor feed anode, we can increase the amount of electroosmotic flow uh, in the system by designing new membranes. Uh, and so this will bring more water into the system. And so this is shown here in terms of the over potentials or the total cell potential. Uh, we can look at this at the liquid feed canal. We can also increase the temperature. And so as we increase the temperature from, uh, let's say, ambient conditions to about 80 degrees C, we're increasing the amount of water we're bringing into the system from 0.03 bar, about 3%, to 0.5 bar, 0.48, uh, about 50% of water at the higher temperatures. And so this is showing, once again, better performance, but without any of the kind of flooding effects that we get with the liquid systems. Uh, and so here we're going to look at the product distributions of the partial current densities. Uh, and so once again, this is a trade-off between the effects of temperature, the effects of the ohmic effects, the effects of CO2 and flooding. Uh, and so we can start to capture, and if we want something like propanol or ethanol, uh, what we're seeing, or, or ethylene, uh, the liquid feed case is uh, outperforming it. Uh, and, but there's regimes in terms of the applied potentials where we're hitting these kind of sweet spots of the transport of the local pH and really how we can control the local microenvironments. And so what we see here is we get this sweet spot here of high efficiencies are possible for the liquid feed case. Interestingly, as we, if we look at some of the other cases like ethylene or propylene, what we see is actually the vapor feed case at the higher temperatures is actually performing better. And this is just due to a lot of the reaction kinetics uh, and how they scale with temperature. 
with formate, uh, we see kind of at the lower over potentials, definitely with hydrogen as well, uh, at the lower over potentials is better um, and similar to any of the kind of the products. So what we see is really the mass transport is controlling a lot of what happens in the system. And even though we have a good catalyst, it's the transport and really the local microenvironment. We need to think of reactivity as not only just a, a single uh, catalytic activity, but really what are happening with the local concentrations and how a material is operating within that environment. Uh, and finally, you know, we can do optimization studies using the model. And so this is looking at different catalyst layer thicknesses. So as I mentioned, as we change the catalyst layer thickness, we're changing somewhat the utilization and the pH and the CO2 profiles throughout it. Uh, interestingly, for almost all the catalyst layers, except for the very thin one, the total current density and the total cell performance uh, is pretty similar. The polarization curve is similar here. But what we see is there's a differentiation in the product distribution. And once again, this is due to the fact of where that local pH is, where those local concentrations are, uh, and the potential gradients. And so this is just comparing around uh, four volts. These things all collapse uh, just due to the fact that they all start just reacting very next to the membrane. Uh, but intermediately, we can then think of, you know, once again, these sweet spots of potentials, uh, which might be a, a function and we might be able to control by changing things like the catalyst layer thickness depending on what product we want. So uh, a final example is to look at this exchange solution. And now what we want to do is, you know, we know that the polarization curve is going to be better uh, because of the fact you have this liquid environment. But what's interesting then is to actually compare the same flux. So this is the same kind of rate or the same amount of work the catalyst is doing. Uh, so at the same flux, we're going to have different uh, potentials. Uh, but what's interesting here is we have also different product distributions. So although the product distribution is somewhat similar, there are differences. And that's due to the fact that since the applied over potential is different in these systems, and they scale differently depending on their transport coefficients or, or transfer coefficients and exchange current densities within the system and the TAFL slopes, because of that, you get different product distributions, even though nominally the flux and the local fluxes are the same. So finally, uh, what I'd just like to hope that I, I showed in, in this seminar and lecture is that transport phenomena electrochemical systems plays a very important role in performance. It's really controlling the reactants, the reaction surface. Uh, it's really understanding how that microenvironment that sets up and all the local concentrations impact that catalyst materials. Uh, and then furthermore, when we take materials and integrate these into these membrane uh, electrode assemblies, it could require new functionalities or, or new integration schemes uh, to use a material that we might have tested, for example, ex situ. Uh, we looked at exchange or full membrane electrode assemblies or gas diffusion electrodes are good for CO2 reduction. We need to consider overall CO2 utilization. And once again, the transport of the ions, the local pH, and the CO2. Uh, and to explore a lot of these systems and these fuel cell like architectures, we like to use mathematical modeling. We believe it's ideally suited for exploring and analyzing the device performance. Uh, but of course, more work is needed as we start to build out these systems that are more and more complex. Uh, so finally, I'd just like to acknowledge a lot of the researchers, especially uh, Philomena Wang, uh, who is a graduate student of mine. Uh, and this is a energy conversion group overlooking the San Francisco Bay. Uh, as well as a lot of the CO2 work is all done, uh, was done under the work of the Joint Center of Artificial Photosynthesis, uh, or JCAP. Uh, and these are kind of the main CO2 papers, as well as a, a recent review that we had uh, with some of our colleagues to, to look at some of these issues of, of transport.